sound up there. Test, 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 test. Okay, got that. Whatever that did was. Oh. Well, we're on the air, and I had to run downstairs with four seconds left, so I cannot breathe now. <laughs> uh, we're glad to have all of you here. We're uh, thankful after a week that affected so desperately by sickness and that kind of thing, we're glad that people are coming back around and beginning to get back out involved. I think that will be good this weekend too so uh, I think we had six or eight families whole families affected so we're glad that that's passed uh, we're glad you're here let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you so much for the opportunity we have uh, to be in your house and to share your word I pray God that in the process of this study that we would grow that we would learn that we would move and be moved by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would touch lives in a special way. Father, I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, somebody give us a word of testimony. Glenda Sue? <laughs> that's good that sounds like my mother though <laughs> up and around uh, trying to encourage be the encourager that's a good thing who else all right we'll get into this study we're in revelation chapter six um Revelation 6 is the beginning of the opening of the seals. There are seven seals. Uh, it is, in my opinion, the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. There will be some that will argue with me. They'll think it comes at the middle of that Daniel 70th week. But I believe it comes now. I think what we saw in chapters 4 and 5, the glory of God, the dominion of God, on the throne was uh, powerful and uh, I think it helps us to understand why John was moved the way he was moved because he was in the presence of a mighty God and he recognized that presence so purely um, I want to just look back I'm going to turn back to Revelation 6 and I want to read some of the passages, passages early there's no way we can get through chapter 6 completely tonight, in my opinion. We might be able to, but I don't see that happening. So we will, we will go here and go as far as we can. Uh, the first few scriptures, there's quite a bit to talk about, and we'll do that. In chapter 6, verse 1, it says, As I watched the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll, and then I heard one of the four living beings say with a voice like thunder, Come. I looked up and saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow, 
and a crown was placed on its head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. When the Lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, Come. Then another horse appeared, and a red one it appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority of to take peace from the earth, and there was war and slaughter everywhere. When the Lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Come. I looked up and saw a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings saying, A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay, and don't waste the olive oil and wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, Come. I looked up and saw a horse whose color was pale, green. Its rider was named Death. And his companion was the grave. These two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world? And avenge our blood for what they have done to us. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Christ, who were to be martyred, had joined them. I watched the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all of the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Then everyone, the kings of earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person, all hid themselves in caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, who is able to survive. So this is a very dark time. Uh, you hear people talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's the first four horses. Uh, really, there's not much discussion about who the person's on the the horses following that first horse but there is discussion about who that first horse rider is and when you read about it you may have some questions yourself and that is that white horse rider and him holding a bow and wearing a crown and going forth to conquer the world there are a couple of different thought processes about who that is to some of us uh, it is the Christ wearing a crown, carrying a bow, uh, which is um, the, the ability to conquer uh, with the gospel and spread it to the entire world. Through all of this time, in, in the seven years of tribulation, the, the knowledge of God and who he is and what he has done by taking the church out is going to grow prolifically. The, the word is going to all of the corners of the earth. And so some believe that the image of the white horse rider with the crown, the Bible said he was given a crown, but we know that that crown is not symbolically like the crown he will wear in Revelation 19 as the white horse rider. So whether it's him or not, I, I can't tell you. Whether it's somebody that uh, he is going to appoint to be the white horse rider or not, uh, that he's going out to conquer the world with the word. Now, there is one viewpoint that says he would be the Antichrist because uh, of, of being told by uh, this living creature, this being in the heavenlies, uh, the Lord will be ruler of all. And the Lamb is still indicated as holding the scroll so uh, he's God he can be anywhere he wants to but I don't think he was using uh, his image necessarily as that first horse rider uh, but he may be 
we, we won't know that till we get there, uh, apparently. But he was going out, and he was going to conquer. The Bible said he was going to conquer. And this would make Zechariah's two visions uh, about the horseman kind of the background for John's vision. Uh, the influence of the writing of Zechariah is, is seen in, in John the Revelator. He, he's read what Zechariah had to, to say. He knew about it. And, and if you read it, you will see uh, the comparisons of the two. I can give you an example. Uh, in Zechariah 1, 7 through 17, I saw during the night a man riding on a red horse, but he was stang standing among the myrtle trees that were in the ravine. Behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. And I said, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who was speaking with me said, I will show you what these are. Then the man who was standing among the myrtle trees responded said, These are the ones whom the Lord has sent out to walk to and fro on the earth. In Ezekiel's passage, he said the white horse rider was sent out with the other three horses. So it likely is not the Lord himself, but it could be. Uh, there, there may be something in the way the Lord's operating there that I don't know about. But it is important that we know what his mission is and why he's accomplishing it. And that was uh, very much because uh, the enemies of God would see and know the glory of the message of Jesus. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Uh, in Revelation 19, 11 through 16, John wrote, he said, I saw the heaven open, there was a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. There is no doubt about the description of the white horse rider in Revelation 19. Uh, that's why I think there's some division. Most of the writers that I've read believe that the white always symbolizes divinity and deity, and it represents purity and holiness. The bow represents conquest. This is a picture of the gospel's conquest of the world. I, I believe that that's probably accurate in the sense that it is uh, the conquest of the word. You see, we are setting the stage for the coming of the abomination of desolation, which was the announcement of the Antichrist and raising him up as God. Uh, it will be... Uh, uh, we will become completely aware of the false prophet at that time. We will know who he is. Uh, the Bible talks about the great whore. He's talking about an organized church. Some have thought it to be the Catholic Church. Others have thought it to be uh, the, the Church of Islam uh, because of the false teaching there. Um, it's, it's hard to know what that will be. But I promise you as... As the events begin to unfold after the church is raptured out, it's going to be cataclysmic. And there will be people here who knew the truth about God, who had either never accepted the Lord as personal Savior, or who had fallen away, that are going to be in that time, and they will have an opportunity to be martyred for the cause of Christ. All of these martyrs under the altar... Uh, are going to be people who have uh, realized, man, to spend a moment losing my head or an eternity in a devil's hell, I'll take the martyrdom. And I don't know that there will be a great number. If you can't live for the Lord now, how are you going to live for the Lord then? How are you going to do that? It's just hard to imagine. The, the fact that the church is no longer here, the spiritual leadership is no longer here, means that there's going to be a, a complete segment of our society that is an influence. The church is an influence today. How many of you know that? The reason the government doesn't do any more than it does, it's already trying to destroy. But the church is a, a monumental movement that they can't, I mean, right now they hate that Roe v. Wade was sent back to the states for the states to, to decide. Uh, they are doing everything they can to secure the rights of LGBTQ, those people. Uh, they're doing everything they can to create confusion and, and uh, on what genders and those kinds of things. 
these are all signs of the times. There, there is a war going on uh, with Russia and the Ukraine, and it's, it's in all likelihood. I would not be surprised if it, it moves on over into some of the European countries and you begin to see the EU begin to get involved and fight with Ukraine as allies. Uh, Ukraine is not a member of NATO, and Putin did not want them to be, so uh, they did not want to uh, poke the bear, so to speak. And uh, if you read in, in Ezekiel, Daniel, the Bible talks about the great bear coming down from the north. Russia has typically been the, the area of the country that was considered the great bear. And so there's so many things happening in our, our world today that tell us that the times are close. I, I believe COVID and, and the pestilence and the sickness that's gone around the world, I think all of that, it sets the stage. Uh, the world is looking for somebody to bring peace. And once the church is taken out, if the rapture of the church took place today, you would see very quickly a move in the Western culture to begin to find somebody in an emergency situation to make them a peacemaker. And then the, the uh, Antichrist would then begin to work to unite one world government. Uh, it was pretty clear that uh, Mr. Obama was uh, in favor of a one world government. He was raised in uh, an Islamic madrasa, so he had studied Islam. He was looking for the 12th Imam, uh, very much like we're looking for the return of the Lord. Most people who don't know much about Islam don't know that they're looking for a return just like Christians are. And uh, it, it's very important to know that that's going to come to bear. If you'd have told me when I was a, a young boy that the division between Christianity and Islam would be the focal point of the end of times politics, I might have argued with you because I, I thought maybe just the fact that uh, hedonism and, and uh, secular humanism were such big parts of the Western culture that just sin in general would have been the battleground. But if you sit down and think about it, the battle between Isaac and Ishmael, which started when Sarah gave a handmaid to uh, Abraham, that battle's been going on all of this time. And the similarities between Islam and Christianity in so many ways, Abraham being the father of both, uh, it, it's easy to see how that would remain consistent through that time in history. I'm going to give you a minute to make, ask a question or make a comment. His son, his son by the handmaid, uh, Ishmael, was the beginning of the, the Islamic line. And then Muhammad came in and began to write, and uh, Mike could tell you more about it. He studied Islam quite extensively. Uh, actually, the, uh, the, the father of both Christianity and, and Islam is Abraham. Right. Because both sons made a uh, statement when they uh, started practicing them. I would rather the, the, uh, the religion of my father, because Abraham worshiped one God. Right. And so I Ishmael, going the way he went through Islam, in their minds, their God is the same God that Abraham was talking about. But when you study Judaism and all the things that came through the, the sons and the apostles and the, the relationship with the Jews culturally uh, and the, the promises that were made to the Jews, uh, you can tell rather quickly that there is a difference between the God Jehovah and the, the God that Islamics worship. Now, they'll debate you all day on what they believe, but I can tell you right now, based on the Word of God, God has always been consistent in His writing to the people. Do you know what I mean that? In the Word, 
Everything is consistent. That's why when we start looking at these biblical typologies in Revelation, and white has always represented purity, whoever that white horse rider, I don't believe he can be the Antichrist, as one segment of students believe, because he would not be riding a white horse. That's an indication that is consistent all the way through uh, of purity. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a doctorate in divinity, and I don't know... Uh, many things, but it's just not considered uh, consistent with typology. Michael? Well, and I, I, don't think that's a, I don't think that's far off the mark. And the reason I say that is the rider of the white horse is being commanded. And Christ has been given all power in heaven and earth. You, you want to be careful when you start telling the Lord what to do. <laughs> I mean, we got people that do that all along. Uh, but I believe the rapture of the church. I, maybe I ought to ask this question. How many of you believe in a literal rapture of the church? I believe that. Uh, I don't think there's any question that uh, one of these days that eastern sky is going to split open. There's going to be a trumpet sound. And in Second Thessalonians, the Bible said the dead in Christ are going to rise and we that are alive and remain are going to be caught up together in the, in the air. Now, I, I know there are millions of believers. And compared to 300 million in America and 7 billion in the world, I don't know how many of them are going, but the Bible tells us many times that many are called but few are chosen, that the straight gate is a narrow gate. Many will try to get there, but few will actually find it. So th there's going to be a sifting of the sheep and the goats. And so I, I think you have to, and in in this week I've had several different uh, Things come before me as I, I'm studying I, for Sunday. I, I'm going to, to deal Sunday with the fruit of the Spirit as it's contrasted with the things that we're living with today. We're living with anger. We're living with frustration. We're living with depression. We're living with addiction. We're living with all of these things. But the church should be a, a strong point, if you will, for the fruit of the Spirit. The problem is that too many of Bible-believing Christians are maybe not Bible-believing, but too many people who come to church that don't know the Word, haven't studied the Word, don't really believe that the rapture of the church is going to take place and that judgment is going to be uh, established for those who refuse to, to give up their lives for Christ. Uh, we're, we're living in a time when a, a lot of people come to church. They enjoy the social aspect. They enjoy the music. They enjoy all those aspects. But the, the moving of the Holy Spirit is when we allow Him to fill us to overflowing. I, I'm not just talking about speaking in tongues or being slain in the Spirit, but I'm talking about the power of the Holy Spirit equipping us to deal with the issues of today. I mean, if, if you look at the fruit of the Spirit, one of those is patience. I don't know many of you that are very patient. <laughs> I got three fingers pointing back at myself. I don't many, know many of you that, that like to wait. You, you get frustrated at God's timing. Uh, and yet, patience, long-suffering, Gentleness, meekness, temperance, mercy, all of those things have to be a part of our lives. And yet so many of us are toxic and caustic in our attitudes. And, and I, as I looked at these things as we're studying the, the coming of the Lord and, and the unfolding of these seven seals, man, when that first horse is unleashed and the gospel goes forth, 
there's going to be a move. There are going to be people respond to the gospel because the gospel brings repentance. You know what I'm saying? When you, we preach the word, the word is going to go forth and, and, and touch hearts. And from that, people are going to make a commitment to God. Now, the church is already gone. But this word is going forth because the Bible said it has to be preached to every people. And so that's, that's going to take place, and it's going to conquer. And the moment that happened, how many of you believe there's going to be divisions among segments of people? I mean, if, would you say that we're living in an angry time now? I mean, on both sides. I mean, people are very angry. They're, they're, uh, Greenwood Mall. Guy goes in with a, a weapon and kills people indiscriminately till he's killed. Now, the fact that somebody had to carry a weapon and be prepared for that says a lot about what's going on in the world today. The fact that we had 17 or, eight or 12 or 18, whatever it was, people go out to the range last Sunday to prepare for the security team at our church means that people recognize that there are people who hate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, people are defacing pregnancy centers all over the country that believe in the right to life. There are people being slammed, people being slandered, people being killed because they believe that. That is the sign of the time that we're living in. It is a horrible, dangerous time. And when that white horse rider goes out, he's going out Conquering the enemies of God. The conquest is the word beginning to be made real so that people see it. Yeah. Whatever this white horse rider is doing, it will be evident to the world. I believe with the advent of world wide web and streaming and videos and all that stuff. I mean, we've seen things we've never seen before because everything's being filmed all the time. I don't think it'll be anything that's missed. And I believe he's going out uh, and, and, I, and I think the fact that he's going out as the first seal and then the fifth seal as it's open, those martyrs under the, under the altar are looking forward to their redemption. They have been bloodied. They have been harmed. They have been killed. They've been dragged through the streets. They've been beheaded. And they're looking for redemption. Man, we suffered for you. Now, now make it right. And so you see what happens in the first seal, and then you see what happens in the fifth seal. And we'll look at that a little bit as we go along. Uh, but that first rider is out to promote the gospel, and he's going to overcome the enemies of God upon the earth. Uh, then the second seal in verses 3 and 4, the vision of Zechariah are backdrop for what John sees here. In both Zechariah's vision, a red horse is seen. The rider is to take peace from the earth and to cause mankind to slay one another, driving, driving them to, to such by means of the large sword in his hand. This clearly depicts war and reminds us of Jesus' words that before the end comes, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Now, you know, in the old days, uh, y'all won't remember John G. Hall, Miss Bev might, uh, had the big thing that he would stretch across and he would talk about the dispensations and, and he would talk about in his talks about the end time of insects with stingers in their tails. The only way the writer could describe it was, was more like scorpions with stingers in their tails. And likely he's talking about aircraft that they couldn't even imagine existed in those days. And the descriptions that were written of that, John G. Hall uh, would, would talk about those things to some degree. And, and how, I mean, if, if you think about it, uh, one of the things that Donald Trump caught so much grief from uh, the Mideast countries was he sent a drone 
and destroyed a general that was responsible for who knows how many deaths uh, in the war with Iraq and Afghanistan. And out of nowhere, the guy was getting in his car not even knowing he's under surveillance or under attack. And that drone knocked him out and destroyed so much they couldn't find his body. So, I mean, it, it, the, the ability of these weapon systems that we have, they're going to strike quickly. You know, you would think in, in the years where people were fighting on horses with swords and shields, a war might like, like that might last for years and years and years. But in a day when nuclear weapons are involved, we've got, we've got submarines sitting off the coast of all of our antagonists around the world. And my son was on one of those and talking to him. He said, I can't even tell you what the capabilities are. But when you've got a boat that's posted with 23 nuclear warheads on board that nobody knows is there, and they can target these major cities, you can create nuclear holocaust in a matter of moments. I mean, uh, most of us are old enough to remember Nagasaki and, and uh, uh, Japan and, and the nuclear bombs, the H-bomb that was dropped there. I mean, those clouds and the effects weeks and months and years after because of that atom bomb that was dropped, uh, uh, the effects of that are you and I have, you know, we're so used to seeing bodies come home being blown up from IUD, IUD, IUDs uh, and gunfire. We can't imagine the total elimination of every part of a body with the kinds of death that will come at that time. And this second seal is an indication that the likes of China, the likes of Russia, the likes of Iran, all of these, you're not going to convince me that Iran doesn't have nuclear capability right now. They may be hiding their ability because they don't want us to know. We've probably done as much as we could to limit them getting it. But I guarantee you they're bad actors all around the world in the underworld. They're making sure they have that ability. And when that happens, the focus is going to be on the Middle East and Israel And because of that, it's going to be on the United States because we are its number one ally. So it, it will be probably the first time since Pearl Harbor that we will see fighting and war made upon our homeland. And it will be worldwide. Any questions or comments? When you start talking about these things, it's not pretty. Well, you're about to bust. I don't. <laughs> All right. The third seal is the black horse, and that symbolizes the famine. And I, I remember uh, David Wilkerson had a guy that used to travel with him, Dallas Home, and he would sing a song about the end time. Life was filled with guns and war and all of that. Talked about how food would cost a day's wage. You know, it was going to be so expensive. And if you look at inflation right now, all over the world, we, we have inflation. But there are, there are people in the EU right now that are having to uh, limit and ration food because whether you realize it or not, Ukraine is one of the top three uh, corn producers in the world. I mean, you, you and wheat. You live in Indiana, you see corn everywhere. Think, boy, we got a great crop growing this year. But it's not enough to feed everybody that around the world or seven billion people. And uh, Ukraine, they're blocking and destroying ships going in to take out the wheat and grain out of Ukraine. And food prices, because of that, are going up because short supply means high price. And uh, so. The world is, is looking at some of these indications as they come right now. You know, somebody might say, well, do you think that, that seal has already been broken? No, I don't. I think that it will be so drastic and it will hit so violently 
And so apparently that people will, that especially people that have a background in the church will recognize, oh, this is that, that, that seven years of tribulation the Bible is talking about. The disappearance of millions of people may not ever really be explained. The government will have a way to explain that away because they'll want to calm you down. They won't want you thinking about your missing children or brothers or moms or dads or all of that. Uh, right now, we've got, I, I see articles on John Bonet Ramsey. She's been gone for over 10, 12, 15, 20 years, whatever it's been. Nobody knows where she is, and we hear about her all the time. All of a sudden, all of these people are gone. Somebody's going to want to know. Mike? Right. Well, it's going to be worse than that because believers are going to be taken out of here uh, before these seals are unleashed. And that black horse is going to bring famine with it. And not only famine only, but plague and sword. I think what we've seen with uh, COVID is just a scratching of the surface. I mean, none of what they told us about that was true. I mean... These mutations and variations, uh, they told us if we get vaccine, vaccinated, we would not be in danger. Uh, if we'd wear masks, we wouldn't be in danger. And I guarantee you Joe Biden has been vaccinated twice and, and boosted however many times, and he just got it. Now, you can say, well, it, it's lighter on you, but it, that's not necessarily true. Some of these people that have been vaccinated had it much worse than some of those that did. So I, I'm not into that debate necessarily, but... Uh, I want you to recognize that plague and sickness, because in many areas there won't be places to dispose of the bodies. Think about South Louisiana where we, we can't put anybody in the ground. You know, all those sepulchers are on top of the ground because the water table is so high you can't bury them all. There are a lot of places around the world, uh, in India and different places that they don't have room to bury the bodies. They'll, they'll have to begin to cremate and, and burn those bodies by the dozens at a time just to get all of that covered because the, the death will be so uh, widespread around the world. Uh, talked about the oil and the wine were untouched, which would indicate a relatively limited judgment. In the Old Testament, the olive, the grape, and the grain were the great blessings of God, provided the staples of life. Then we get to the fourth seal. The rider of the pale horse is identified as death and hell. Actually, Hades, which is called the realm of the dead. Uh, followed after him, ready to swallow up death's victims. They have power to kill with four judgments, the sword, famine, plague, and wild beast. How in the world do you think wild beast will be an issue with societies as, as well equipped today? I mean, we've got zoos and dogs and uh, pounds and, and all of those things, but wild beast will be an issue. How do you think that comes about? That's right. And, and there will be people who let them get out because of that. And uh, so you're going to have uh, wild beasts that we have to deal with. Now, maybe more over in the African countries and things. Uh, Mike and Marigold Cheshire are over there. I, I saw a post from them. Mike turned 76 today. It's amazing. Brother Cheshire's uh, made it to 76. Uh, traveling around the world his whole life. He's healthy as a horse. But those animals are going to be affected by the death that faces the world and that is going to be moved upon the world because of the opening of that fourth seal. Then the fifth seal, the scene now shifts from judgments on earth to an altar in heaven under which reside the restless souls of those who've been slain for their Christian witness. They cry out to God as the holy and true one. Christ is the one who is holy and true in verse 3 and 7 to avenge their, long, their while longer until their number is complete. These martyrs for Christ are pictured as being under the altar. 
either because their poured out blood was being looked upon as a sacrificial offering or because the altar symbolized security and they were safely under it in the presence of God. Uh, let's talk about death for a minute. Lost my dad in April. Uh, I ended up with a pair of his house shoes that fit me, and I put them on and wear them. And last night I was sitting in my recliner, and I looked down, and I, I looked at my dad's shoes, and I just had a moment. I told Glenn, I said, I miss my daddy. I miss my daddy. But I miss my daddy knowing where he is. I miss my daddy understanding that very soon I'm going to see him again. I miss my daddy knowing that everything he taught me about the Word, he, he lived. And he wasn't perfect, but he was a man who strived to please God in all that he did. And I miss him, but my hope is in Jesus. Can you imagine the, the heaviness of people who have no hope? Danny and I have talked about several times. He knows one of these days you'll see his daddy again, his mommy. You know, it's going to be a great day. But what about those people who have no hope? What about those people who know that death, hell, and the grave is going to be swallowed up into a great lake of fire? And those people are gone forever. Nobody likes when we start preaching and talking about that because it's hard. In our world, the enemy has uh, tried to make the gospel so benign that people cannot imagine a judgmental God who hates sin, who would call destruction and fire upon people who are, are not ready to meet the Lord. Uh, Jerry Calandrillo posted a little cartoon today of a mechanic at the gate, and Peter looked at him and said, Well, except for some of the words you used while working on that car, you'd have made it. You know, anybody here get frustrated on occasion and your not-so-Christ-like self shows up? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a reality. And, and, and I think as you look at it, you have to ask yourself, Lord, I want to make sure I make heaven. And yet, wave after wave after wave of the attack of the enemy comes on us right now. Because he wants to knock us down and defeat us and, and, and keep us from eyeballing the, the prize, which is the mark of the prize and the high calling of Christ Jesus. We've got to stay focused. That's why the Word, that's why services, that's why interaction with brothers and sisters and Bible studies is so important because when death strikes and people are gone, people are going to be afraid. People that are afraid do crazy things. You know what I'm saying? They do crazy, crazy things. And now here we've had death come through. We've got all of these martyrs under the, the altar of God. And they're crying out for justice. And God opens, or the Lamb opens the sixth seal. With the opening of the sixth seal, cosmic catastrophe strikes described by John in terms very familiar to his readers. It was nothing less than the dreaded day of the Lord predicted in the Old Testament. There were sevenfold cosmic judgment, the number seven depicting finality and completion. Earth shakes, sun darkens, moon reddens, stars fall to the sky, sky rips apart, mountains and islands move. Folks, all of this description, if, if you think about what you know uh, or have learned through what NASA's been doing and, and all of these uh, worlds that are out there beyond ours, when one planet is affected, the whole cycle of the solar system is affected. And th that's what he's talking about, man, earthquakes. Everything is beginning to take place. It's going to be unbelievable what happens. I, I, got, I got a buddy that lives in Houston, and a couple of three years ago, I was concerned about him. I, I know his lifestyle, and it's not a, a Christian lifestyle, but he's one of the nicest guys I've ever known. He just, 
has rebelled against God and, and lives an alternate lifestyle. And, and I wanted him to know that believers still would love him even though the lifestyle he lives. And so I called him and I said, Bill, I want you to know if you, his, his building was flooded. It flooded the first three stories of his building, but he lives on the sixth floor in a, in a high rise in Houston. I didn't know that. I said, if you need a hotel or you need something, I will help you get a hotel. And he said, Larry, I love you. He said, I appreciate you so much reaching out to me. But he said, I drive a Tesla. I'll be all right. Uh, you know, he was telling me money is not an issue for me. His dad had owned the, the hardware store in Monticello growing up. And I'm sure when, he, when his dad died, he and Lisa inherited quite a large sum of money. And he was big in business. And, and so, but I didn't ever really think about it. I thought maybe because everybody knew his background, maybe they wouldn't reach out to him. And I wanted him to know that somebody loved him and somebody's praying for him in this time. But he said, Larry, you can't imagine the devastation. There's, there's three floors under my building that are a ghost town. He said, we live in an elite place, but there are things in those bottom three floors that nobody wants to look at and go see because death lurks there. They're finding snakes in the building and things, deadly snakes and things that they had never really considered. And I said, well, it's an indication of the time we're living in, Bill, and I want you to know that Jesus is coming. He said, I know. I was raised with that. I said, you need to keep it in mind. Make things right with the Lord because this is coming. I didn't want to sound judgmental. didn't want to sound hateful, but, you know, there's a difference in trying to fill up a church and telling people about the end so they won't fall into a devil's hell. And that, that's what we need to be about. We need to make people aware judgment's coming. Jesus is coming. And we need to be ready. Amen? Amen. Finally, after the sixth seal was open, all of these things are happening. The same phenomena was pr predicted by Jesus to accompany the end of the age and the final coming of the Son of Man. What seems so unshakable and eternal and very, the, the very heavens and earth now give way beneath God's almighty hand, offering no place to hide and no security whatsoever. In verse 15 through 17, a sevenfold depiction of humanity is given, starting from the highest and going to the lowest. Kings, princes, generals, the rich, the mighty, slaves and freemen, all fleeing in terror from the face of the Lord, crying out to the mountains and the rocks to protect them. Look, folks, that's real fear. When you want the mountains to come in on you, that's real fear. God's work through the white horse rider indicated there was power in the Word of God. People knew that the conflict was coming. All of this time, there, there's an announcement through those, those first years uh, of a Savior. But it's not the Savior. It's the Antichrist. He's coming to bring peace. And, and according to most Bible stories, Scholars that I know, that first three and a half years will look like great times because he'll bring peace. He'll bring all authority under one roof. He'll begin to make things affordable again. People will feel like there's safety. He will calm the wars and those kinds of things in that first three and a half years. But then in the next three and a half, you're going to see devastation even greater than in the first three and a half. Yes. I need to clarify something for me because I mean I understand what you said about uh, chapter six, verse two, about the white horse. <coughs> I heard you right because you know my hearing aid. You said that most believe that that was Jesus, that was the Christ. I, I don't want to say most. I say there is a division between Bible scholars. Some believe that it's the Christ. Some even believe it's the Antichrist. In Swigert's Expository Study Bible, he says, in his side notes, that uh, it's the Antichrist representing himself as a man of peace, but actually coming to put marital rule. But then, and that's in the King James Version, but in the NIV Version, it claims that it is the 
says, uh, can I read this sure. real quick? Sure. It says, who is the conqueror? There are the six spirits. It's probably a picture of the powerful, destructive force of military conquest. The three riders <coughs> conquer, the three riders, the conqueror is grouped here in violence, famine, and death evil and brutal in their impact. So it's not likely that this conquering rider on the white horse is the same as the one in uh, Revelation 19, 11 through 21, which is clearly makes reference to Jesus Christ. So I, I don't understand how some can read King James Version as opposed to the NIV and one say it's the Antichrist and the other say it's Christ. Well, and here, here's, here's the part that is at issue. Number one, he's called for. He's called for from the heavenlies. And I don't believe the Antichrist is in the heavenlies. Okay? I, I, I don't see where that can be because the Antichrist will be on the earth in living, breathing flesh. And this first... White horse rider is going to be called. That he's going to be summoned. One of the four beasts in the midst of the throne room says, Come. And this white horse rider comes. When he comes, he's got a bow, which indicates conquest. And the the re it says he has a bow, but it doesn't say he has any arrows. It's it, to me that represents he, he wants to get your attention, but he's not he's not prepared to well, and I'm not, when I say this, I'm not sure that it's the Christ himself either because the Lamb's got the scroll. If it's not the Antichrist, and I don't believe it can because he's not up there, he's on earth, then it's another being that has been mandated to go forth as the white horse rider to propagate the gospel and have many victories. And that may be the setting for that first three and a half years. I'm not arguing that. I don't know, but just as I look at it and you, you weigh, okay, is the Antichrist alive today? I don't, how, many, how many years are we from end times? Anybody got an idea? Do what? Well, the spirit of the Antichrist, but I'm talking about the man born in the Middle East that will represent the Antichrist who has powers and abilities, if we are in the end time, I guarantee you, he's, if, if we are there, he's alive and he's already positioning himself with the powers of darkness to be there. Now, this white horse rider, and, and I wouldn't argue the point because I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I believe the indications from the scriptures would, would say that the, the great, these beings in the throne room said come then I heard one of the four living beings say with a voice like thunder come and I looked up and I saw a white horse standing there his rider carried a bow and a crown was placed on his head now it's not the many crowns that Michael was talking about but it's a crown and it represent, represents leadership and Jimmy may be right that this is a, a, a being of the power of the Antichrist that's going out and doing this, setting the stage for them to, in the middle of the three and a half years, proclaim him God. Because that's basically what's going to happen. But uh, there's argument on both sides of that, and they both make good arguments. The only thing I would say is that when the white horse comes in 19... There is no weapon. He's going to speak destruction. He doesn't need a bow. He won't need a crown. He'll have one, but he won't need a crown because written on his vestment will be king of kings and lord of lords. So when you study these things and you ask yourself these questions, you have to ask yourself what part of this fits with what we've read in these other passages in Matthew and in, in Ezekiel and Daniel and those places because they've given us a picture, if you will, 
of the things to come. And of course, once that last seal, uh, if you look at it, I, I don't, don't want to mess it up. In verse 16, the throne of God is emphasized to stress His authority. This is a common figure of speech in the Old Testament and in Revelation. The wrath of the Lamb. He, he's still depicted as the Lamb at this point. He's not depicted as a white horse rider yet. He's still the Lamb. He's still opening the seals. He's still doing the work that He qualified Himself to do by being a sacrifice for many. So it, it's kind of like when people talk about uh, the apostolics believe that Jesus Christ, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are all one person, and His name is Jesus. The only problem I have with that, I don't care if that's the way God does it. I know He said, me and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen my Father. I get all that. But you're not going to make me believe that when Jesus was baptized in the river by John, and the Father spoke from the heavens and said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased, you're not going to make me believe he's a ventriloquist and through his voice and then somehow sent a little bird down to represent the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I believe that, that God is God in three persons and that he is working as God, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all one in purpose and work and that the Father is directing the Son and the Spirit to do all that he does. So when he talks about the throne... He's not just talking about the conquering king. He's talking about God Jehovah, who is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Does that make sense? Or did that confuse things? I'm going to give you a chance to a ask a question or two before we go to prayer here. Sure. But there's certain qualifications of it. It has to be a direct, he has to be a direct uh, descendant of Muhammad, who is a direct descendant of Abraham. That confused me for a long, long time. But it, then it made sense to me because God's plan is his, not ours. He brought the, uh, the truth, uh, the word, and it began with Abraham. And in the final rapture, Well, and if you look at it, he's contrasting. How many of you know God contrasts everything? Yeah. That which is God, that which is the enemy. Yeah. He said there's a difference in a fruit in a bush that produces fruit and a bush that doesn't produce fruit. He said if a bush doesn't produce fruit, what happens? It's chopped down and cast out. He's, re he's showing that the work of Christ, where the church has been taken out, the martyrs are giving their lives throughout the, the finishing of getting the gospel to places that it needs to go. And this 12th imam, if he is actually the Antichrist coming, uh, the similarities and how the enemy has taken the truth and perverted it. Who, who is Lucifer? He's Satan. And what's his M.O.? He's a liar and he's the father of all liars. His work is going to be done in deception. That's why it's important as much as this is kind of like a big old piece of bubble gum that you chew on gets bigger as you go along because there's so many things that some Bible scholars would come in here and jump on and intrigue you with that, that I don't really know. I'm telling you what I've studied and known for 40 years in the ministry and in 20 years before that in my home believing that Jesus was coming to take the church out and that then after the church was gone, there was going to be seven years of tribulation. And in the middle of that seven years, the Antichrist was going to proclaim himself to be God. Uh, the, the false prophet and the great whore will embrace him. And they'll begin to make it so that it's impossible for, non for believers to buy and sell. All you that are chipping your dogs, 
You need to think about what you're doing. White horse. Rider. Yep. What was he sent to do? He was sent out to conquer. Who or what? He, he was conquering. The, the Bible said he was conquering conquest. That's what she, she asked about. And it was to take the gospel to every corner of the world and that it would win many victories. So, what does it say he's using the gospel to conquer? Do what? Where does it say the white horse? It didn't. This is all typology. And that's where it's coming from. Okay. So. Exactly. That's why when you talk about he's winning many victories and and, and in to conquer and to con conquering and to conquer. Many translations they all say it the same way. That's exactly right. So he was sent out conquering and to conquer. Yep. And that means taken over by strength. Yes. Usually by military. That's why the bow is probably there. But at the same time, he's proclaiming a truth that makes him believable. He's always got to proclaim a truth to make him believable because people in the West are never going to bow down to somebody who doesn't believe in God because of, and, and the work of the gospel, because of the things that have been laid as a foundation for us in the Western culture. And even in, in the other countries around the world, China's got a huge church growing over there. And you're not going to fool those people by somebody who just comes out and preaches a straightforward lie. He's got to bring a compromised message. So that's why Brother Swigert may be right that he is a, a, a person sent by the Antichrist to go out and conquer and do those things to set the stage for that three and a half years of peace and then set him up as God. <laughs> I don't care. You're asking questions that you've already got an answer for. No, I don't. So... Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I have faith. God's got it all worked out. Oh, I do too. And it don't matter who reads what and says their interpretation. I agree with you. God's got it. I'm just... As far as the Antichrist goes, Balaam started off his life a good guy. Did he not? Yep. Did he end up a good guy? No. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, there's nothing to say that Antichrist <coughs> won't be the same type of a person. I agree. They'll start off preaching the gospel, living the gospel, and then, hey, if I do this, woo, well, I mean, Lucifer will take anybody up to that pinnacle and offer him kingdoms if he'll just compromise. He'll make it look so beautiful yep. because that's what he does. Yep. Well, it's there's compromise throughout Christendom because of money and power and fame and all of those things. I mean, you go back uh, even to Jim Jones and Joan Towns. The only reason I know this, my uh, Cindy's dad was a member of the church in Indy that he pastored over in Beach Grove. And he came to Jack and told him he was married to the wrong woman in, in the latter part of his time there. He had gone on a sabbatical and took a bunch of books on sorcery and witchcraft and all those things. And uh, he told Jack he needed to put Hazel away and that he would find him the right woman. And then he got so much pressure because he was an Assembly of God preacher that he had to, to withdraw from the assemblies. And that's when he went out and started the People's Temple in California. And from there, 
you know, he had 1,500, 2,000 people that were willing to move with him around the world. He took enough of the truth to deceive, and people were deceived. I mean, it, it's terrible. Uh, and and I, I've heard J Jack preach that message, why I didn't die in Jonestown, Guyana, because Jim Jones was a very powerful preacher in the beginning, doing exactly what Corey's talking about. He started out on the right side, then the enemy took him up to the pinnacle and offered him all these things. I've so, heard him preach. Huh? I've heard him preach. I'm his, uh, his grandson is one of my nieces. <laughs> right. So it's, it's a reality. So we, we, need to, we need to keep in mind what we're talking about now. Corey's right. I'm not worried about it. Faith says that I'm going to be gone in this time. Well, and he's going to coordinate power so he can manipulate people in those places and put himself in that power, if my guess is, is correct. So, uh, but we need to recognize it. after chapter 5, the church is gone. If you're part of the church, you're serving the Lord, you're going to be gone. None of this should cause fear in us. But we need to be aware that it's coming, and we need to warn the people to flee from the wrath to come. Amen? So, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Rochelle sent me a message, said she wasn't feeling well. She was involved in some of the different ones that had COVID, so let's be in prayer. Steve's got COVID. Uh, Tonda's recovering from COVID. Uh, Mickey now has COVID. Mary had it. Now, Mickey. There's just a large list of those. <laughs> Don't tell me that. <laughs> So let's be in prayer for those. Anybody else you can think of? Candy. Okay. Yes. Send him a message today. Let's be in prayer for Caleb. Jesse. All right, stand with me. Let's go to prayer. Father, I thank you today because I know your word is truth. I know that as we look into the future, we are people who have hope that we will be spared many of these atrocities because we'll be called away with the church. But Lord, I, I want the church to be ready to see things as they are unfolding. Begin to be aware that the time of the coming of the Lord really is at hand. Uh, Lord, I don't know when you're coming, but I'm looking for you and I want to be ready. I want you to forgive our sin. Wash us white as snow. Now, Lord, I reach out and pray for Rochelle that you would touch her body and strengthen her. Steve Ellis has been sick the last two or three days. Lord, reach out, touch him, and strengthen him. Lord, uh, Mary and Mickey and Michelle, Lord, reach out and strengthen them. Tonda and her family. Uh, Donna, uh, she's, Diana Sheese and her family were affected by it. Lord, you just reach out and touch every one of those in the name of Jesus, that they would know the healing power of God. Lord, I believe the he healing power of God is available to us today and that you're going to work and move through us. Now, Father, I pray for Caleb. You strengthen him, touch him, minister to him, Lord, uh, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.